Well, it's hearing day again. Jared Isaacman just faced the US Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation in his bid to become NASA's administrator. And there were questions on everything from SLS to Starship. Here's everything you missed. This is, of course, the second time that Jared Isaacman has faced this committee, the first time being back in April during his first bid for NASA Administrator. If you need to quickly get up to speed with the whole fiasco, there's a video right here which will help you out. The last time I sat before you, uh, I introduced myself, my qualifications, and the challenges and opportunities ahead. This time I'm here with a message of urgency. That sense of urgency comes from the fact that we are knocking on the door of 2026, a year which will see humans fly around the moon for the first time in half a century. Critical flight tests demonstrating on-orbit refueling and lunar landings from SpaceX and Blue Origin, all while China is continuing to march ahead at breakneck speed. Just 11 hours before the hearing started, Chinese company Landspace successfully launched their Methalox Falcon 9 scale rocket for the first time, coming within 60 meters of landing the booster. This is not the time for delay, but a time for action. Because if we fall behind, if we make a mistake, we may never catch up. And the consequences could shift the balance of power here on Earth. To that end, I want to assure you, senators, I'm not here for personal gain, to favor or enrich contractors, to close centers, or disrupt programs that are essential to completing America's objectives in space. If confirmed, I'm here to bring urgency and an extreme focus to the mission, to do all I can working with the best and brightest at NASA, to lead humanity's efforts to unlock the secrets of the universe, and ensure American leadership across the great front, last great frontier. Senator Ted Cruz, who is chairman of this committee, is a strong supporter of the space launch system. So unsurprisingly, he wanted to start things off by making sure that Jared Isaacman still supported the mega moon rocket as well. As you know, NASA, NASA's human spaceflight program, Artemis in particular, is critical to maintaining US leadership in space. But as I think you can appreciate, spaceflight comes at a significant cost. Its success requires program stability. The United States can't dominate in space if our commitments change wildly from one administration to the next or from one appropriation process to the next. Congress wrote into the big, one big beautiful bill that there shall be a stable, fully funded path for Artemis, at least through Artemis V. Congress also dedicated money for the Gateway Lunar Orbit Space Station and the Orion Crew Capsule. What concrete steps will you take to maintain the Artemis program's long-term stability? Senator, I, uh, I appreciate the question. And um, similar to my, to my previous hearing, I absolutely believe that the current architecture with SLS is the fastest path to achieving our near-term lunar objectives which should be to return to the moon before our great rival and establish the infrastructure so that we can realize the scientific, economic, and national security value. That being said, however, Isaacman did raise an interesting point. In order for us to actually land the astronauts on the moon, it will mean that one, or ideally uh, two, commercial partners will have pioneered reusable heavy launch lift capabilities and orbital propellant transfer to get the lander to the lunar environment. Um, and when we see American astronauts walk on the moon again, it means one or both of them were successful. The Artemis 3 mission profile currently sees a Starship landing on the moon with astronauts on board. Starship is a super heavy lift rocket, much cheaper per flight than SLS, and if it can land humans on the moon, then it's going to be close to an operational state by Artemis 3. The same can be said for New Glenn, because if it can deliver Blue Moon Mark II for Artemis 5, then surely it will also be in an operational state. That begs the question, why does SLS need to stick around? There is no question the over, overwhelming near-term priority is to return American astronauts to the moon and again establish an enduring presence. Um, but as I mentioned before, in order for those American astronauts to step foot off a lander onto the lunar surface, it means one or both, and actually potentially many more commercial providers will have pioneered uh, reusable heavy lift launch capabilities and on-orbit prop transfer which is the same capability, really the next giant leap capability that America needs for missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. There's a reason why I said currently sees when talking about the Artemis 3 mission profile, because acting administrator Sean Duffy recently announced that he was opening up the contract to try and increase competitiveness and speed up the timeline. To this end, Senator Maria Cantwell asked Isaacman if he agreed with this decision. I, I think that competition is fantastic. I think the best thing for SpaceX is a Blue Origin right on their heels and vice versa. And speaking about not losing, Senator Eric Schmidt questioned President Trump's nominee on why it's important that America 
American astronauts return to the moon before Chinese Taikonauts, who are currently scheduled to set foot on the lunar surface no earlier than 2030. If you were to, to answer the question, why is it important that the United States of America gets to the moon first or gets to Mars first ahead of the, the Chinese, what would, what would be your answer? Well, Senator, I think there's a couple reasons, one of which uh, is fulfilling a promise that's been made by every president since 1989 and over $100 billion that's been uh, funded by taxpayers on our grand return to the moon. I think uh, it's imperative that we do so, and failing to do so calls into question American exceptionalism beyond just our expertise in the high ground of space. One topic which Jared Isaacman wasn't shy to share his fascination with during the first hearing back in April was the applications of nuclear technology in spaceflight. Today, he continued to champion nuclear research and development. But I'm very big in, in nuclear in space. Uh, I mean, there are numerous applications for it. You know, there's propulsion applications with nuclear electric, nu nuclear thermal propulsion. There's surface power requirements. We're going to need surface power, you know, for applications that don't have direct sun exposure. We're going to need uh, surface power to likely manufacture propellant for missions to and from Mars and certainly uh, deeper space exploration missions where there's less solar effectiveness. So it's an area that I think is squarely within NASA's uh, mission to be working on the near impossible to do what no one else can do and attract the the talent that will want to work on exciting mini Manhattan project like programs. President Trump's budget request for fiscal year 2026, which was released earlier in 2025, sought to slash NASA's science budget in half and significantly reduce the agency's budget as a whole, going forward knocking billions off its allocated funds. Because of this, multiple politicians were very interested in Isaacman's current position on NASA science, and he continued to advocate for everything that falls under that umbrella, from Earth observation to planetary exploration. But of course, this was a Senate hearing in front of politicians, so inevitably, some politics was going to be discussed, including the return of this classic moment from the first hearing. During our, your last nomination hearing, you refused to confirm whether Elon Musk, with whom you have deep personal and financial ties, was present at the meeting that then President-elect Trump offered you the job of NASA administrator. So I wanted to give you one more chance to set the record straight. Was Elon Musk in the meeting at Mar-a-Lago when President Trump offered you the job? Senator, it's, uh, it's great to have a conversation again. Um, I, uh, I thought we really ran this one to ground last time. But uh, I, I, what I will tell you, Senator, and uh, I wish I had the opportunity to explain it further before, is my first interview with the president, I've, I, I think I've had uh, several opportunities since to re-engage, was in a ballroom type setting, Senator. There were dozens of people moving in and out that I would not say were in the meeting. It's a very simple question. Was Elon Musk in the room when President Trump offered you the job? Uh, Senator, my, my interview, my conversations with the president, and there were dozens of people moving in and out of the room, and I, I don't think it's fair to bring any of them into this matter. Something else that Jared Isaacman isn't afraid to share his love for is aeronautics, which is, of course, the often forgotten first A in NASA. When questioned on this first A, he didn't hold back on what he thinks NASA's aeronautics department needs and his admiration for Boom Supersonic, a company developing the first supersonic airliner since Concord. I think NASA just needs a lot more X-planes, honestly. Uh, that was a really exciting one that we all had an opportunity to watch rather recently alongside the recent performance from from Boom, but I'd love to see us uh, have multiple programs that are exploring radical designs in airframe and propulsion, and when they do have those breakthroughs, not dissimilar to the 1970s, 1980s, when NASA was experimenting with fly-by-wire and thrust vectoring capabilities that have made their way in commercial aircraft as well as military aircraft like the F-22. And with that, the hearing came to an end. But one big question remains. When will Jared Isaacman actually be confirmed and sworn in as the NASA administrator? That was a pretty big part missing from the first bid, after all. Well, final written questions from senators can be submitted until business close tomorrow, December 4th. This is a much more expedited process compared to the first time around. Then we should expect a vote of the committee sometime next week. Assuming that this is majority in favour, then the matter will be for the entire Senate to vote on. But when will that final vote take place? Well, just take a listen to what Senator Moran had to say. And I look forward to his confirmation and look forward to the Senate considering it uh his approval in this committee and the Senate approving it uh, presumably uh, next week. So perhaps in under 10 days time, we could have Jared Isaacman confirmed as NASA's administrator. 
Only time and politics will tell. I've been Ryan Caton for NSF. Thanks for watching and goodbye.